Greetings in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful to the Lord for the opportunity to share with God's people during this encampment. Please allow me to take a moment of personal privilege to affirm, acknowledge uh, our conference administration, our president, Elder Henry J. Fordham III, our vice president of administration, Elder Pete Palmer, and our Vice President of Finance, Elder Lawrence Martin. I'm so thankful to Mr. John Alberti, our Superintendent of Education, for this humbling invitation to share on this night of education where we are affirming, applauding, appreciating staff and teachers, recognizing students, our schools, for the tremendous job that they are doing in providing both academic and spiritual nurturing for our children. We thank each and every one of you who have given of your time, your talent, your resource to educate our children, preparing them for the next level, the next chapter of life. My assignment is to share with you what God has laid on my heart and so I want to call your prayerful attention to the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel, chapter 1, verse 8. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Here's what it says. Now Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I want to talk for the next few moments as the Lord will allow with this sermon title in mind. But Daniel. But Daniel, let us pray. God, we thank you for this time. And we simply ask that you would speak for me, speak through me. That your words will be heard and felt. Hide me behind the cold, cruel shadows of the cross and may the word find good ground in the hearts of your children. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen authored by its namesake, the book of Daniel opens to us a number of perspectives as it relates to handling what needs to be heard by God's people who at this point in history are suffering in exile. Life has taken a turn for the worse because according to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 6 and 7, against him, Jehoiakim, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came up and bound him with fetter to take him to Babylon. Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has been conquered, and as a result, so are many of the Jews. History records that over 4,600 people from Judah and Jerusalem were taken captive, carried away from their homeland, torn from their comfort, removed from familiar surroundings. This is a dark and terrible time in Judah's history. And to add to the depth of the wound, Daniel 1 verse 2 says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Yes, the Lord gave Judah into the hand of Babylon. Isaiah chapter 39 verse 7 prophesied this, saying, And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget and they shall be eunuchs in the place of the king of Babylon. The Lord allowed Babylon, a godless people, a don't know God people to gain victory over his chosen people. The Lord turned in the Jews over to Babylonian custody. Kings of Judah were consistently tied to idolatry. The prophet after prophet was sent continuously to warn Judah's kings about their immorality, their injustice, and their unfair treatment of the poor. Yet there was no regard for God's word that was shared. 
no obedience to Jehovah's desires, no remorse or repentance displayed. Because the leadership wouldn't listen to God or God through his prophets, life, liberty, hope, and freedom would take a hit and the Jews would spend deca decades in a foreign land, exiled. But according to Warren Wiersbe, God would rather have his people living in shameful captivity in a pagan land than living like pagans in the holy land and disgracing his name. Among the exiles were young men of excellent resume, young men who were of sterling example of citizenship and academic intelligentsia. These men had the right qualifications and were summoned to the king's court that they may become part of Nebuchadnezzar's cabinet. These young men were selected to undergo assimilation. Now, according to Webster's Dictionary, assimilation is the process of taking in and fully understanding by way of information or ideas, by way of society or culture. It is a way of, of, of allowing to absorb and integrate people, ideas or culture to, to regard as or become similar. Nebuchadnezzar's desire was to re-educate these young Hebrews in the Chaldean way. He wanted them reorientated to Babylonian thinking and acting so that they would look and sound more like Babylon and less like Judah. He wanted these young men to experience full indoctrination into the ways and means of life in the king's royal court in Babylon. There is no doubt in my mind that Nebuchadnezzar was cunning in his approach while at the same time applying some pressure. After all, if he could turn these boys, he would not only uh, establish loyal Jews in Babylonian culture, but he would also succeed in erasing Jewish culture and legacy in these young men. Nebuchadnezzar was intent on changing these young men from who they were when he found them to an example of what Babylon could turn them into. Babylon, Babylon, this word which means confusion, deception, and mixture would not have much relevance to you today in terms of its literal location, but it certainly has symbolic meaning for there is still a culture or system of Babylon existing in the world today. There are still people who want to hold others captive in exile in Babylonian system. Babylon is used by many nations as the embodiment of oppression through economic and social slavery. Oh yes, even within the confines and the comforts of these yet to be United States, this republic, this perceived emancipated democracy, Babylon still exists. Some of you in here today can identify with the reality of having been approached to sell out your morality and sacrifice it on the altar of convenience and expedience. You can place yourself in Daniel's shoes because you are facing pressure to conform to another way of speaking, another way of thinking, another way of living. You are existing in exile and not sure how you're going to survive. You're, you're not sure what to do or which way to turn. Can I encourage you to follow Daniel's lead? It was Asphanaz who tried to influence Daniel to walk on the wild side, to step over into Chaldean living. But Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar tried to bring Daniel into his cabinet. But Daniel, the staff, Nebuchadnezzar's cabinet made attempts to entice with food and wine. But Daniel, they even tried to change his name. They tried to erase his meaning. They tried to suppress his purpose. Uh, they, 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 they called him Belshazzar, Bel to protect his life, meaning to protect his life. They tried to substitute the names given by Jehovah with the names of false God. But don't miss verse eight. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he would not defile himself. Don't miss this child of God. There is no way that Daniel would avail himself 
to fall into the temptation presented before him. He knew that his body was God's temple and partaking in the king's wine and the king's meat would only contaminate what had been consecrated to the Lord. No matter what is offered to you, child of God, nothing is worth abandoning what God has purposed in you. Babylon may offer you money. Babylon may offer you power. Babylon may offer you popularity. But at what cost? Everything about Babylonian education was contrary to Daniel's beliefs and the education he had received in Judah. Daniel didn't need to adopt Babylonian culture or Chaldean civility because the foundation of his education came from a different type of kingdom culture. They tried their best to flip the boys, but Daniel refused re-education. They tried their best to turn Daniel against his Israelite values, but Daniel rebuffed indoctrination. He resisted the king's declaration. He refrained from assimilation because Daniel knew his assignment. Daniel had been educated in his home about what his ultimate purpose in life was. He knew his assignment. It was to reflect the character of God in every area of life. He knew that he was responsible for his temple as well as his testimony. He knew that his assignment was to transform and not to conform. And sadly, many don't know what their assignment is. They have taken on assignments that may pay off dividends by getting you promotions and certifications and higher pay and network affiliation. But they are not invested in the assignment that has eternal significance. So many are invested in what it takes to be known, what school offers the best computers, the math and the science. But can I tell Tell you, Harvard may get you to defend landmark cases in the courtroom, but a godly character and faithful living will have you worshiping in the throne room. Daniel comes from a godly home in a godly nation, godly schooled with godly intent. Even though the nation's disobedience rendered them spiritual felons, there is evidence that these boys received a rich educational foundation. They received a godly education. They, they learn at their young age what it means to be loyal to Jehovah. And great care was taken to see that these boys were properly trained and educated. Listen to their description. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand. Might I suggest today that Daniel's following successes were due to the educational foundation that was the foundation of his life. He learned what he was created to do and who he was created to be. He was not a Babylonian citizen. He was a citizen of Judah. He was trained and nurtured in how to take care of his body and how to be faithful in the tasks that were given him, how to be a great steward of what was placed in his care, taking great care to give uh, his best effort every time he undertook an assignment. Daniel's education was more than reading, writing, literature, and mathematics. Daniel and his friends were young men who excelled both in their spiritual and their academic education. He knew that the education he was being given, the education that he was being nurtured with, prepared him for today and tomorrow. And as God's children, we need to know our assignment. We are to be salt to flavor and light to shine. For Daniel, his godly education didn't just turn on like a light switch when he got to Babylon. He was able to be successful in Babylon because he lived a life loyal to what he had been taught. Your assignment is not just what's on the chalkboard. Your assignment is not just what's in the syllabus. Your assignment is not just the lessons in the email. Your assignment is not just what's been taught to you in, 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 the, in, in Zoom. Your assignment is not just what's in the job description. Your assignment is not just in the list of daily routines on a task board. But your assignment is to live out Christ's values every single day. Christian education, real Christian education education starts in the home and prepares young people to shine as clear reflections of Christ wherever they go. Because Peter Marshall says, without Christian education, without the principles of Christ incul inculcated into young life, we are simply rearing pagans. 
I'm going to say that one more time. Peter Marshall says, without Christian education, without the principles of Christ inculcated into young life, we are simply rearing pagans. While we travel in exile during these days of Babylonian influence, while Nebuchadnezzar and his people are trying to put pressure on you to adhere to their way of thinking, every child of God needs to make sure they are giving priority to the spiritual assignments in their life's syllabus. Shine your light. Reflect God's character. Love your neighbor. Walk humbly. Love mercifully. Do justly. Practice forgiveness. Take care of your body. Give of your best to the master. Stand on God's promises. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. So when you are given an invitation to undergo assimilation to Babylonian education, you can say that you pass and you can say no thanks because you know your assignment. And Daniel and his friends knew their assignment well. It was to walk by faith, believing that God would honor their obedience. Their assignment did not start and stop in the promised land, but their assignment continued in the foreign land. And our assignment is not limited to seasons when we are walking in purpose, but also when we are living in persecution. And I hope you have not lost the type of environment they are in. Remember, child of God, they are in Babylon. Beloved, they are in a place where conformers get promoted. They're in a place, a city that is built on deceit and manipulation. They are in a place where double-minded, unstable people reside. They are in a place where people will do just about anything to survive. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not contaminate his body with the king's meat or wine. He and he and his friends knew that living obedient to God's word was more satisfying than the king's portion of food. They knew their assignment, but they were also prepared for the adversity. Now, I want to help you here to by reminder that adversity is a part of life. You can't do anything about it, but you can be prepared to handle it. These boys were snatched from their familiar surrounding with no promises, ripped away from their families, and all they have is themselves. They are teenagers with no adults to look out for them, no one to speak up for them. But when temptation came, they relied on their faith and not on the royal food. Their location may have changed, but their loyalty did not change. Their names were changed. They had been known by names that had godly meanings, but they were given names that had pagan roots. To change their names was in a sense to change their identity. But even though they changed their names, they couldn't change their character because it's not what they call you, but what you answer to. It's not the adversity thrown at you, but how you handle that adversity that defines you. And that's a lesson for us today. At some point, you will leave the safety net you are in. At some point, you may find yourself in Babylonian uh, 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 systems. You may find yourself in Babylonian exile, subject to Chaldean influence by yourself, and you will encounter adversity. And when you do, beloved, remember that faith isn't obedience in spite of evidence, but faith is obedience in spite of the consequences. All of us encounter adversity from time to time, adversity at home, adversity at work, adversity at school, adversity in finances, adversity in relationships, adversity in the church, adversity in health, adversity in the streets. How will you handle it? What type of foundation do you have to pull from during these moments? I might I suggest that one of the best solutions for handling adversity is to lean on the strength of God. Hang on to his word. God's word will help you in the face of adversity. God's word will give you courage in crisis. God's word will give you strength for the journey. It will pick you up when you are down. It will give you comfort when you are conflicted. God's word is not only a foundation, but it is a valuable asset in the life journey of a child of God. Consider that life is not just about completing tasks, but the continual development of one's character. And I have seen the doors that can be opened 
when we employ a godly character. I have watched the favor of the Lord carry people to opportunities that they could never imagine. I have seen what God does when you firsthand, what God does when you honor his word. I have also experienced the, the having my name changed and feeling all alone, but I also know that the God my parents taught me about, the God I heard about in school, the God I came to know for myself, this same God has given me so much of a foundation that it prepared me then and continues to prepare me today for whatever comes. And I can't promise you that Christian education will make you immune from life's challenges, but it will give you the tools to navigate it. Uh, you need the right tools to help you to navigate life. Uh, the, the, the right tools. I, I, I remember uh, putting together a piece of equipment in my house and I was putting together the equipment. And as I was putting together the equipment, I noticed the pieces and I looked at the tools and I said, man, I got a tool that's, that, that'll work better with that. And I used that tool on the piece of equipment. And lo and behold, as I was using it, uh, something didn't look right. Something wasn't happening the way it was supposed to happen. It wasn't turning with the ease. Come to discover that the reason why they, they uh, had that specific tool in the direction is because that tool would work best for the best result of what I was putting together. And can I just tell you today that the best tool to help our children, the best tool that will help our children to make the right choices in life is when we use a tool of Christian education in the home, in the church, in the school to help them to to reinforce what they're being given on a daily basis so that when adversity comes, they too have the right tool to make the right decisions for the best result. These boys had the right tools to handle this adversity because they dared to trust God. They reached back into the training they had received in Judah and God gave them favor with the one in charge of them. He consented to give them the pulse and water they asked for instead of the king's meat. Now I can imagine those on the sidelines looking at these boys eat pulse and water. Day after day, they watch these boys honor the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They consumed the diet they were converted in and convicted of. We, we weren't there, but I know there was somebody who was thinking these boys ain't going to make it. That there might have been even people bringing meat around them and setting it in front of them and 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 and. and, and waving their hand over the scent so that it ran uh, under their noses saying, go ahead and take a bite, take a sip. But these young Hebrew Christian educated boys stood on their conviction. Please allow this quote to touch both genders. Uh, the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men in, who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. They, they, that, that coming from the book, Education, page 57, paragraph 3, written by Ellen White. They, they, listen, these boys, these boys, they were tempted, but they wouldn't give in. They were tried, but they wouldn't give up. The efforts to turn the boys were made, but Daniel refused assimilation because he knew his assignment. He was prepared for the adversity, but because of the strength of his association. Daniel knew who he was and whose he was. There was no doubt in his mind that God would not leave him, that God would not forsake him, or that God would not make a way for him to accomplish his divine will. He knew God would stand by his word some way, somehow. He just needed to be faithful and watch God work. God would honor their faith. God would honor their obedience. They would end up looking far superior to those who tried to assimilate them. And long before Daniel and his friends were born, God had made a covenant with the children of Israel. He promised that they would be his people and he would be their God. His simple desire was that they be faithful and obedient to the ways of the one who delivered them, rescued them, provided for them and protected them. Daniel just needed to trust in the promise of God through loyal association and devotion to God and God would 
in turn respond to his faith according to his sovereign will. So I want to leave you with this message. Trust in God and never doubt. Show me a child that doubt ever educated. Show me a mountain that doubt ever moved. Show me a stone that doubt ever rolled away. Show me a Red Sea that doubt ever split. Show me an exam that doubt ever passed. Show me a temptation that doubt ever resisted. Show me a sickness that doubt ever healed. Show me a problem that doubt ever solved. Show me a miracle that doubt ever performed. Your godly association will make a way for your advancement even even in exile, even in Babylon, because God gives according to our need. When God is the foundation of all learning, when you put him first, God will give you opportunities. God will give you advancements. God will give you accomplishments that will blow your mind. God gave Daniel favor with the one responsible for attempting to re-educate them. God gave Daniel and his friends knowledge and all wisdom, skill, and literature. God gave Daniel the vision and the dreams and the ability to interpret them because God gives according to need. If our greatest need had been information, God would have given an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have given a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have given an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have given an entertainer. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God gave Jesus. And it is Jesus whose character we are called to reflect and reveal to everyone who works as a teacher, as a staff member, as an administrator in a school. The calling is to not only teach the children academics, but to teach them both through the word of God and through your life's example what a successful life following Christ looks like. To every student, the godly education that God wants you to have is first in your home, then nurtured in your churches and schools with the different activities. Daniel was able to honor the Lord in the most wonderful way because he was drawing on the education he was able to honor God in exile because his foundation was sure and firm that he had received in Judah. I might appeal to those of you who are watching, who are listening today, is will you take on the conviction of Daniel that even while we are still walking in this land of exile, waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ, would you be willing to have the type of conviction that you will not assimilate to a Babylonian system or education, but you will rely on the godly education that you have to be the sure and firm foundation, the building block that will help you to succeed wherever you go in life? I want to pray with you as we close. God, today my prayer is that you would help somebody to have a but Daniel experience that whenever they find themselves faced with assimilation to practices, habits, principles, ways that are not like you, that they'll have the conviction of Daniel to boldly declare, give me what God wants me to have and I'll be okay. To have the conviction of Daniel to refuse to be influenced and impacted. To refuse to be called out of your name, knowing that our names are child of God. That our names are given to us by you. Our identity is rooted in you. God, I pray this afternoon for that man, woman, boy, or girl who knows that Babylonian influence is waiting on them even after they've heard this message. May they have the conviction of Daniel because of what you have placed in us, because of the assignment you have given us, that 
their conviction, their decision making will honor you. This is the prayer that we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you.